second episode of Kilroy Was There, and we're going to bring you a perennial classic. We're going to go into Saving Private Ryan. A 1998 movie by Steven Spielberg, Saving Private Ryan is one of the very few war movies that war veterans will frequently say gets the experience of being in frontline combat right. I'm Matt Broman, I'm your host on Kilroy Was Here, and it's time to find out what Kilroy did while they were saving Private Ryan. Saving Private Ryan is fictionalized storytelling about the Normandy invasion, but it's based on actual historical events and one very real family. The Nyland family were four brothers who all enlisted to serve in World War II, one of whom, Edward Francis Nyland, was a part of the air crew on a B-25 bomber. When his plane went down in May of 1944, he was believed dead. In fact, he had been able to escape, and he was captured and spent time in a prisoner of war camp until the end of the war. The other three brothers served in various parts of Operation Overlord, the Normandy invasion. Preston Thomas Nyland fought with the 4th Infantry Division, and he killed. He was killed in action on June 7th. Bob Nyland and Fretz Nyland were both airborne troopers. Bob with the 82nd Airborne Division, the All-American Division, he was killed in action while advancing through the town of Newville. Fritz Nyland, upon whom Private Ryan was based, served with the 101st Airborne Division. He ended up receiving notice that his brothers had been killed and he was going to be sent home. Three historic events form the core of Saving Private Ryan's fictional storytelling. The Battle for Point du Hoc at Omaha Beach, the Battle for the Village of Newville, and the Battle at La Fierre. The Battle at Point du Hoc involved Ranger troops of the 2nd and 5th Battalion seizing a Nazi gun emplacement that was able to rain down death on Omaha Beach. The principal difference between what we see in the movie and what happened in reality is just distance. The guns at Point du Hoc are not within sight of the beach at Omaha, but because of the range of weaponry in the 1940s, the guns at Point du Hoc were absolutely capable of raining down death on the troops at Omaha Beach. So when the Rangers seized Point du Hoc, they did so in the face of ferocious counterattack, and they did so having to advance from Omaha Beach while under fire the whole way. As a result, there's a Ranger memorial at Point du Hoc, and it is one of the most important memorials that the United States has commemorating Normandy. When Reagan gave a speech at Normandy to commemorate the anniversary of the Overlord invasions, he gave it from the Point du Hoc Ranger Memorial. The second real-life event was the battle at Newville. Now, this was included primarily because Bob Nyland was killed at Newville. Newville as a town is simply one of the towns in Normandy that's fairly close to the beaches. The battle at Newville is significant primarily because in this battle, Bob Nyland advanced with the rest of his troops from the 82nd Airborne Division, the All-American Division, and unfortunately encountered a German counterattack, and so they needed to retreat through the town. Bob died manning a machine gun so that they could cover the rest of his company's retreat through Newville. In the movie, Newville is described as a street-by-street battle where the Americans are slowly advancing. In reality, the Americans got into Newville fairly quickly, but then were driven out street-by-street by by a German counterattack. What's most significant in the Newville scenes in the movie is the discussion of how Field Marshal Montgomery's failure to take Khan on D-Day is causing the entire Allied invasion trouble. In reality, Monty was unable to take Khan until August 6th, almost two months after D-Day. As a result of that, the American invasion had to turn right, seize all of the terrain of the Cotatin Peninsula in Normandy, including the port in Cherbourg. Cherbourg finally fell on July 19th, 1944, essentially six weeks after the Normandy landings. And until they had Cherbourg, they really didn't have a port of any size at all because Khan was still denied to them until August 6th. The Battle of Newville was thus a brief conflict that's important for its connection to the Nyland story and for its expositional value in helping us get a sense of how the invasion of Operation Overlord 
preceded by stages focused on obtaining ports as they moved forward. The final battle that's described in Saving Private Ryan is the battle at the Meridoret River. In truth, there were two battles at the Meridoret River, one at Manoir de la Fiere and the other at Chef du Pont. In both of these cases, there are bridges that allow crossing of the north-south running Meridoret River. Crossing that river was essential because any German counterattack, especially by armor, needed to cross the Meridoret River to get into Normandy. Similarly, any breakout by the Allied invasion force needed to cross the Meridoret River. Having an intact bridge is thus pretty essential. The battle at Lafayette was assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division, again, the All-American Division. It is the clear uh, inspiration for the climax of Saving Private Ryan. Over three days, the 82nd Airborne Division force operating under the tag name of Mission Boston, being led by General James Gavin, fought and beat off waves of Nazi attacks. Captain John Red Dog Dolan of Abel Company was able to lead the battle hand-to-hand -hand in cases at the bridge. They were able to hold for three days, losing 250 Americans holding that bridge until they were relieved on June 9th. In these three events, what we see is not a comprehensive overview of what happened in Normandy, but we do get the sense of just how intensely fought many of these battles were, how desperate the action was, and how unbelievably brave someone would have to be to go forward without body armor in the face of high-velocity projectile guns, bullets, and explosive shells. The principal difference between what we see on film and what they experienced in reality is that the amount of distance that someone could be killed during World War II is so much greater than we see on film. On film, it looks like every shooting happens line of sight. You can see the gun, the muzzle blast. But in reality, in World War II, many, many soldiers died, never getting anywhere close to seeing the person working the gun on the other end. It is for this reason that Saving Private Ryan is an effective combat film, but still isn't completely accurate to the experience of World War II. The real accurate experience would be so much more terrifying because you would just see people to the left and the right of you fall down dead without even necessarily seeing the person who is shooting them dead. One of the more depressingly true moments captured in Saving Private Ryan is when we see the deputy commander for the 101st Airborne Division dead, sitting in a Jeep in a crashed glider. This was taken from actual historical fact. Deputy commander of the 101st Airborne Division, Brigadier General Donald Pratt, died because he insisted on coming into the landing zone in his Jeep, in a Jeep that was strapped into the glider. Now the glider was already overweight, but they made it extra difficult for the glider pilot by strapping on an armor plate to the bottom of the Jeep to try to protect the general from sniper fire. The net result of all that extra effort to protect the general is that the general died. In the movie, he's called General Amend, but General Don Pratt, deputy commander of the 101st Airborne Division, really did die in the way that this described in the movie. Saving Private Ryan has many terrific examples of World War II slang and acronyms. In fact, there are a few periods of American history where more acronyms and slang were developed than World War II, and many of those are still a part of our life today. So let's run through a few, shall we? First, in the movie, a big point is made of FUBAR, F-U-B-A-R. Obviously, the adult version of it has a different F word to start it off, but fouled up beyond all recognition, has been a great way to describe situations during World War II and frequently in the military afterwards. A related piece of acronym slang is snafu, situation normal, all fouled up, or originally status nominal, all fouled up. The uh, latter version is one I hadn't come across until I was doing my research for this episode, but snafu and fubar are definitely still in regular use in the military. The last one that appeared in the movie was a piece of slang that I didn't know because my own background isn't as an aviator, but the term flat hat. 
comes from aviation, where the idea was if you fly low and close to the ground, you are flat hatting around, meaning you would flatten the hats of the people you fly over. Additional slogans from the movie that made it into our common use is KIA, killed in action, or MIA, missing in action. FLAC, which is actually an acronym from the German, meaning Flieger Abwehr Kanon, or Flyer Warding Off Cannon. You gotta love the Germans. Flieger Abwehr Kanon means Flyer Warding Off Cannon, FLAC. The Jeep is, of course, a verbalization of the acronym GP, or General Purpose. A couple others that are well-known, GI, Government Issue. SOL, straight out of luck. Again, substitute your S word for your preference. And Wilco, out of radio usage, will comply. I didn't know Wilco was, in fact, an um, portmanteau, a combination of two longer words. Two other really famous acronyms will end this little segment we have. First is radar, radio detection and ranging, and then sonar, sound navigation and ranging. Both radar and sonar are regular words that we use now, but they began life as acronyms. Another really interesting quirk is that in the scene in Washington, D.C., where the casualty telegrams are being prepared and the letters confirming the death of soldiers are being dispatched, there are many veterans, there are many officers, military personnel shown with various disabilities, lost limbs, lost legs, lost arms. In all of those actor portrayals, the only person who wasn't actually disabled was Brian Cranston, who plays a officer who's lost an arm. Every other person who is shown in some kind of paraplegic was an authentic paraplegic that Spielberg cast in order to make the movie more authentic. Steven Spielberg has had a trilogy of World War II movies that have their undoubted pinnacle in the 90s. His first World War II movie, 1941, was a comedy that fell flat at the box office despite having an all-star cast. By 1993, Spielberg had decided to make something much more personally meaningful, Schindler's List, and that movie won Best Picture and did very well at the box office, indicating to Spielberg and audiences everywhere that the American film-going public was prepared to handle a movie set in World War II that dealt very graphically with the challenges of that time. By 1997, Americans had decided that World War II was the good war, especially as regards the Germans. And so when Steven Spielberg announced that he was going to make a Normandy World War II movie, Audiences everywhere were excited and in high anticipation. By 1998, when the movie premiered, Saving Private Ryan found an audience that was more than ready, more than excited to celebrate the bravery and accomplishments of American service members in World War II. The movie was the top grossing film of 1998, and despite costing $70 million, was a tremendous profit source for DreamWorks. It made $482 million, making it the top earner of 1998. It was released on July 24th in 1998 and stayed in first-run theaters throughout the rest of the year. Veterans of World War II and their families especially formed a core audience that saw the movie again and again throughout the year. The film was shot in chronological order, like our first movie, Casablanca, but unlike many other films. When Spielberg decided to make the film, he had the cast do a 10-day boot camp, including five days spent in the field with six-mile hikes to condition their performance. Matt Damon, Private Ryan himself, was exempted from this in order to improve the authenticity of cast reactions to his appearance in the film. Now, my fellow veterans might find the idea of a 10-day boot camp with five days in the field and a six-mile hike to be weak sauce when attempting to simulate the military experience. But on the other hand, when you consider that most Hollywood actors never do anything close to military service, it's easy to see why almost all of the actors who participated in that boot camp continue to speak highly of it as a 
formative experience for their characterizations of their characters. Now, when the movie came out, it won five Oscars, including Best Director and um, Costumes and other things. It didn't win Best Picture, though, and this was a beginning point for the Academy Awards separating themselves from the movie-going public. The Best Picture that year went to Shakespeare in Love, which is often seen as an actor's movie, and almost no one will hail as a perennial classic. Similarly, the Best Actress Award went to Gwyneth Paltrow for Shakespeare in Love instead of Kate Blanchett, who had played Queen Elizabeth in the movie called Elizabeth. Now, since 1998, the Academy Awards have consistently gone away from money-making films in favor of movies that critics hail, even if audiences don't see them. But in 1998, we had one last clear shot where the movie that was the big winner at the box office could also have credibly been named Best Picture. And for my money, Saving Private Ryan is the best picture of 1998. So when we think about Saving Private Ryan and we think about that climactic battle at the Merdoret River, it's important to know that the battle at the Merdoret River would have happened only two or three days after Normandy. However, in the movie, it's depicted to have occurred on June 13th. That way we see a passage of about seven days in the movie, even though we only experience really one night with our squad as they go along. Now that doesn't impact the quality of the experience at all. It just means that when we talk about the historical battles upon which this movie was based, we're gonna end up seeing some dates that overlap and are difficult to sync up with the timeline in the movie, which shouldn't be a problem because the movie is a dramatization of the Normandy invasion as a whole, not a documentarian's attempt to capture exactly what happened as it happened. Finally, Saving Private Ryan has been a well-accepted part of the American canon of war movies since its release in 1998. But by 2021, the movie has a slightly different tone. Obviously, just three years after 1998, we all experienced 9-11, and the post-9-11 American military experience was fascinating, to say the least, because of our appreciation of World War II as the good war and the success of Saving Private Ryan in 1998, by 2001, our nation had a massive support for the military and patriotic displays. But by 2021, after the difficult engagements in Iraq and the ongoing war in Afghanistan, and of course the resulting massive increase in partisan divide because of how those wars played out with Republicans and people on the right generally believing that the war on terror was fought as a necessary war and folks on the left and in the Democratic Party believing that the war on terror was some sort of propaganda exercise done to advance the interests of the wealthy and the well-connected our own views of World War II have, if anything, become even more idealistic. You see, by 1998, the idea was that America fought the good war in World War II against the Nazis and would fight good wars against enemies wherever they were, even today. Whereas now, the idea seems to be more that we fought a good war against the Nazis but that we modern Americans lack the moral clarity and the commonality of purpose to do that sort of thing again. For me, I disagree. I believe that modern Americans are just as capable of coming together around a national purpose the same way we did during World War II. The United States community... Kilroy was here, is a product of the Evocati Legal Services Foundation, Map Roman President. This project and every other project of the Evocati Legal Services Foundation is done to bring awareness and support to veterans and active duty service members. If you want to be a part of our project, please join us over at www.evocati.org.in. We are committed to serving those who have served us all.